Well, friends here in Los Angeles and beyond, Merry Christmas and what a joy it is to be invited into your home in this Christmas season. Now, as we gather in this moment, know that you have so many people that are gathering in homes like yours around the city and around the nation and around the globe. And you've chosen to be here with us in what I believe is one of the most significant Christmases of our lifetime. In fact, in your home right now, maybe the sounds in your home have sounded different than it did back in March. You know, maybe you're sp spending the seasons listening to more Christmas music. Maybe even this morning or today, the, the smells in your house smell different than, you know, back in March. Maybe there's some bacon or cinnamon rolls or pancakes that have been cooking. Maybe you're dressed differently than you were back in March. Maybe you're in your Christmas PJs on this day celebrating, but maybe even what you see around you looks different than it did back in March. Maybe you've even bought a Christmas tree to add to your decorations this year. And if you did so, have you heard this? You've helped set a record. More Christmas trees have been sold this year than any year individually before it. And it reminds us that in the midst of this year, we need Christmas more than ever. But of course, Christmas is so much more than the sounds and the smells and the sights. It's this great reminder that God loves us so much that God would come to us in the flesh to give us new hope and new life and to rescue us in ways that we can't do on our own. And on this day, we are concluding a sermon series, taking a look at some of the most famous Christmas carols of all time. And it's actually, it's helped me get into the Christmas spirit in this year. We started this Sunday right after Thanksgiving in the Advent season. And if you've missed any of those, you can go search for Beller Church on our YouTube channel, get caught up and hear how we've unpacked the history and the theology and the practical meaning for us today in 2020 and beyond for the songs of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, O Come, All Ye Faithful, Angels We Have Heard on High, Last week, joy to the world. And today in this last wrap-up sermon, a hymn that was written by a young man simply a year after he began following Jesus. I mean, imagine that. A year after choosing Jesus as Lord and Savior, he writes this hymn, which is one of 6,000 hymns that this gentleman wrote. Second only to Fanny Crosby, who she, she wrote over... 8,000, maybe even close to 9,000 hymns in her lifetime. You know, these are productive people. I don't think they made New Year's resolutions. They didn't have time for it. They just jumped right into creating things for God's glory. But this hymn that we're going to dive into today was meant to be sung on Christmas Day. And how appropriate to be reminded in this year of the reason for this season as we explore Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, Charles Wesley is the writer of this hymn. In fact, he wrote it in the 1700s. The brother of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodists. And it was really these songs that helped followers of Jesus in the 1700s be reminded of the deep and rich theology, regardless of the circumstances around them, of what this season is all about. Now, he wrote five verses. We typically sing only three. I'm going to dive into the first three, and if we've got time, maybe I'll just read the last two of Charles Wesley's uh, verses for you. But this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna dive into these first three, and we're gonna be reminded of three things, powerful things. No matter what you've gone through this year, you can be encouraged by the angels today. And as we get into this, my prayer is that you would be so moved with joy that regardless of What's been going on that you would be so profoundly encouraged by what Scripture says the angels are doing on this day? Second, that you would be awestruck by Christ Jesus, that you would be filled with so much wonder, that it would be so much more than just, you know, the magic of Christmas and the joy of the day, but that you would be awestruck in wondrous awe at Christ Jesus this newborn king. And then finally, that you would experience healing from the Prince of Peace. All right, let me read through the first verse of this phenomenal hymn. 
Hark, the herald angels sing, begins like this. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. It begins with that word that we rarely use in culture, that in the Christmas season we can be reminded of, hark, listen. In the midst of all the noise, in the midst of all the news cycles, in the midst of all the numbers that are out there, listen up, friends. There's news to share with you today. Listen up, listen up, listen up. For the angels are singing. In fact, last week we dove into this, and even the week before we dove into this with joy to the world and angels we have heard on high, there's this great truth that is revealed in Scripture that angels are rejoicing over Jesus day and night, 24-7, singing glory, glory, glory to the Lord Almighty. They sing in Latin, Gloria, in excelsis Dea, glory to God in the highest heaven. And they join not only with themselves, but they join with all of creation rejoicing. But the deep richness of this hymn reminds us that when we listen to what they're singing about, we can be so encouraged on this day. What are they singing? Well, three lines here. First, it's glory to the newborn king. We see this in Luke chapter two, glory in the highest heaven. There is this great rejoicing, this great truth that the angels are giving glory to this newborn king, Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing on this Christmas morning. You know, the word glory I talked about two weeks ago in the sermon, Angels We Have Heard on High. The word glory in the Hebrew language is kabod. Just as a quick recap, if you missed it, kabod means heaviness, weightiness, significance, matter. We use this language all the time in our culture. We give more weight to certain people's opinion. Uh, certain things matter more to us than others. Certain events in our past are more significant and stand out. All those words are kabod, their glory. Every human being on the planet gives glory to everything and everyone in their life, varying degrees. Certain things don't matter that much and certain things matter a whole bunch. In fact, some people's opinion matters so much in your life that you are caught up in the gravitational pull of the weight of their perspective and you, you've changed the words that you speak around them, your behavior around them in ways that enable you to get caught up in their orbit. And these angels remind us, if we have the ears to listen, heart, listen up, friends. There is one who matters more than anyone else. There is one who has more significance than anything else. And it's this newborn king, Jesus from Nazareth, God in the flesh, you see, angels seemingly in Scripture know a lot more about God than we do. And so, of course, it makes sense that they, they would give glory to God. It seems like angels in Scripture don't get distracted by all the things you know, that we do. They don't get caught up in material things. They don't get caught up in you know, trying to fit in in a politically correct sort of way. They don't get caught up in you know, keeping up with others or, or having a right reputation in a way that maybe lacks integrity. It seems like they, they know who God is and they worship God as a result. And there's this great glory, this great sense of God mattering to them that they are caught up in the, the, the grand orbit around God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet... The next two lines of this hymn reveal to us something so profound that, you know, I learned back in seminary and I knew it, but I didn't know it. And as I've been studying for this sermon, I've been sharing it with some close friends and, 
It has encouraged me so much because the angels aren't just praising Jesus for what Jesus has done for them. And they aren't just praising Jesus for who Jesus is. They're actually praising Jesus for the things that Jesus has done that don't directly affect them. Listen to this. Lines three and four of Hark the Herald Angels Sing go like this. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Again, this hymn is saying, listen, listen. The angels are singing. Glory to the newborn king. That makes sense, but peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. You know, angels are like us, Scripture says, in the fact that they can sin. Sin, the Greek word hamartia, it gives kind of the picture of an archer, you know, uh, like Katniss Everdeen from the Hunger Games, you know, pulling it back. And, you know, to sin is to aim for the wrong thing. When we aim our, our energy, our attention, our resources towards things other than God's best for us, that's been a helpful way for me to understand what it means to sin. And when we do so, we miss out on this vibrant life, the life to the full that God promises us. And so we see in Scripture that actually angels not just can sin, but all the angels that exist, countless angels, we have no idea exactly how many they are, have already made their choice and they either have sinned or they haven't. You might be saying, what, what, what are you talking about? Well, Revelation chapter 12, for example, tells us that a third of the angels have chosen to follow the great and glorious angel, the most beautiful of all, the bright morning star, also known as Lucifer, also known as Satan, also known as the deceiver, also known as the devil. When Satan, filled with so much pride, wanted to be like God, and there was war in heaven, Revelation says. And Revelation isn't just a picture of eternity future, it's a picture of all of eternity past present and future. And it says in Revelation 12 that a third of the angels took up arms against God. They sinned. They aimed for the wrong thing in their pride. In choosing the wrong thing, they followed Satan. And scripture says that a third of the angels were cast down out of heaven. Fallen angels, sometimes referred to as demons. Like us, they can choose the wrong thing. They're not the ones singing glory to the newborn king. The third who have followed Satan have made their decision. They've made their choice. They've been cast down out of heaven. It is the other two thirds, the glorious ones who have been aiming true at God, their creator, they're the ones who are singing glory to the newborn king. They're the ones singing in such a way that we should listen. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king, but then they sing peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. While angels can relate to us in the fact that they can sin or not, here's how they cannot relate to us. Did you know that there's not one scripture passage in all of scripture that gives evidence to the fact that, that angels will ever be forgiven? Those third that sinned, that chose to follow Satan, there's no chance for them ever to be reconciled back to God. In fact, throughout all of scripture, whenever there is a, a description of the reconciling work that God does ultimately through Jesus Christ, the saving work of Jesus Christ, the, the purpose of Christmas that God in the flesh would come, it is entirely for humanity and all of God's creation, but it does not include those fallen angels. And here you have two thirds, 
of the glorious angels rejoicing, not only about Jesus, but they are singing about what Jesus has done, not for them, but for you. I want you to imagine it this way. You've been to a sporting event, you know, or a, a great concert. It seems like less these days we're able to go to, but if you remember back, likely perhaps you didn't sit in the front row. Maybe it was in a, a section further back. I remember as a kid going to Chavez Ravine here at Dodger Stadium, and you know, we got the nosebleed seats. We call them the nosebleed seats. They're such high elevation. You know, the, the, the oxygen was thinner up there and you had to, you know, just strain. I remember my grandpa would bring binoculars just to look down to see Kirk Gibson, Oral Hershiser, Fernando Valenzuela in the 80s. I mean, it was just, it was amazing to be there. And it was so loud in Dodger Stadium. And even though we were peering from afar, we were longing to look down at what was happening on the field. We as fans were rejoicing at what was happening on the field. And when our team won a victory, oh, we were on our feet. We were singing, I love LA. We were chanting. It was just, it was amazing, right? Maybe you've had a similar experiences where you've celebrated a team on the field or you've you know, you've sung along with a beautiful performance on stage from afar, but it is clear that it is not you performing on the field. It's not you performing on stage. You are the fan rejoicing in what is happening down there. That is the picture that I want you to have on this Christmas morning. You are on the field. You are on the stage. And all those angels, countless multitudes, the heavenly hosts that are rejoicing are up in the stands and they are rejoicing that now God and sinners, that's you and me, all people, scripture says, have been reconciled through the saving work of Jesus Christ and it began with his birth. The beginning of a perfect life, a sacrificial death, a burial, a resurrection, an ascension, the right hand of the Father. It is Christmas that sets the stage. It is the opening whistle. It is the opening note that is played for this great and grand glorious story that you are caught up in on this Christmas day with all the things going on. It's a reminder that there's angels celebrating the victory of Christ in you. You know, we as humans, we celebrate Super Bowl champs, right? We celebrate World Series champs. We celebrate Academy Award and Grammy Award winners. But the angels, they're celebrating you. Of all the gifts that you can get in this Christmas season, would you open up in your mind and in your heart this truth that the angels are longing to look into this great and glorious truth and they are rejoicing in what Jesus has done for you. In fact, in 1 Peter 1.12, it says that the angels long to look at the good news sent from heaven by the Holy Spirit. And if we as fans can get so caught up and call it our team and we won. We can perhaps understand just a fraction of what it's like to be an angel who is celebrating the victory that Jesus began on that Christmas morning in your life and in mine. So much so that it causes them to rejoice over the work of Jesus. You are not somebody who is alone on this Christmas morning. You are not somebody who is off afar, watching in and peering in and, you know, out in the cold, looking through the, the fogged up window at activity that's going on inside. No, 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 that, that's, that's the angels who are looking in at you. Remember, Scripture says, Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, I will be there. When we're gathered together, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus wants to remind you that, that Christmas is all about the incarnation. God coming in the flesh, beginning this phenomenal story of redeeming redemption 
And for those of us that are followers of Jesus, to be reminded of that today, I know I need that reminder. As a pastor, as a follower of Jesus for 20 years, I need that reminder to receive that gift, but also to give that gift away to others as well. Maybe there's family in your life or neighbors in your life or coworkers in your life or, you know, the person that you see, you know, at the checkout, the grocery store, you know, this is the season where we can give gifts that last throughout all of eternity. To somehow study this truth and to share it with others that, you know, have you ever thought about the fact that, that angels are rejoicing over what Jesus has done for us? Maybe to enter into those conversations. We want to help you in having those conversations. In fact, if you go to our website, you can sign up for new groups in the new year, ways in which you can get connected, join classes. We want to equip you on that journey. But we are people that not only uh, get the gift of Jesus, but we give the gift of Jesus away to others as well. But let's continue on in this great truth because when we realize, even in this first verse, that when we listen, when we heart that the, the herald angels are singing not only about Jesus, but what Jesus has done for us, there is a response that verse one of heart the herald angels sing says that should well up within us. Here's how the second half of verse one goes. It says, join. Would you join on this Christmas day? Would you join the triumph of the skies? Would you with the angelic host proclaim that Christ is born in Bethlehem? So hark, listen, the herald angels sing. Would you too, like them, sing glory to the newborn king? Of all the things in the last year that you have given your attention to, that have mattered to you, that are significant, that are weighty, that that maybe are heavy, that have displaced your emotions or moved your decision-making, would you come back to Jesus? Would you say and recommit to him, you matter most of all. Your opinion is weightier than all others. You, you are more significant than all others. You, you matter more than all others. On this Christmas day, you can recommit to Jesus and you can join with the angelic hosts that are proclaiming glory to the newborn king. Glory is not just a word, it is a lifestyle. It is a way of life. It affects every decision, every thought, every moment of every day. And as a church, when we say we want to be a church that follows Jesus every day and Everywhere with everyone that says that we want the, the gravitational pull of Jesus Christ to catch us up in the orbit and the rhythm of our lives so that there's not a single moment where we are not giving glory through our lips and our lives to Jesus Christ. If the angels can sing about something that doesn't impact them, shouldn't we sing about this very thing that is for us, for you? God and sinners reconciled. Let's give glory to Christ, the newborn king. A lot more verses left though. Verse two goes like this. Christ, the highest heaven adored, Christ, the everlasting Lord, late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. If we've been encouraged by the angels, my prayers that this verse would cause us to be awestruck by Christ Jesus. You know, so often we say Jesus Christ, and you know, it's a great reminder that Jesus uh, is not his first name with Christ being his last name. It's not like Drew Sam's Jesus Christ. That, that's, that's not how it goes. Jesus is his name. In fact, in the Hebrew language, it is Yeshua. In fact, embedded in the name given to him by his parents is this truth of two words brought together. Yeah, it's the beginning of Yahweh, Jehovah, the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, the great I am, and Shua, which means Save. So even in the earthly name of Jesus is a reminder that it is, 
It's Yahweh that saves. It's no king. It's no political power. It's no product. It's no movement. It's no uh, perfect vacation or magic number. It's not an amount in your bank account. It's not a certain degree that you might have or a certain amount of hours that you could work. No, it is Yahweh that saves. And so here we have Jesus who is fully human. Ah, but Christ, again, not his last name. That is a title, anointed one, Messiah, Lord. And this hymn causes me awestruck wonder. And in my prayers, it would cause you awestruck wonder because Jesus wasn't just born on that Christmas day and begin his life in that moment. In fact, how the hymn says it is Christ by heaven, highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come. Now, there's no one on the planet that that could be applied to other than Jesus. I mean, every single person when they're born is not by definition late in time. They're by definition early in time. The moment someone is born, it is first second, second second, third second, you know, the first minute of their life here outside the womb and the first hour and the first day and the first week, the first month, they are not late in time. In fact, scripture also says that life begins at conception. Psalm 139 says, from God's perspective, don't you know, I knit you together in your mother's womb. And so even at that moment of conception, those first few seconds and minutes and hours of life, by definition, every human being is not late in time, it is early in time. You know, and Father Time is catching up to all of us and every single one of us, we're one year older than we were a year ago. And so as the years go by, some of us are later in time than others. But this hymn reminds us that Jesus, when he was born on earth, he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the everlasting Lord. And he came into this earth late in time. He's already existed for all of eternity. This should leave us in awestruck wonder at the mystery, the cosmic reality that is really impossible to wrap my mind around, let alone perhaps your mind around this truth that Jesus has always existed. Listen to these scripture passages. In John chapter one, speaking about Jesus as the word, the gospel writer John, as a Greek citizen speaking in the Greek language to the Greek citizenry, knowing that the word logos, word, was very fundamental to their understanding within that secular society is the source of truth, the source of reason. He borrows that language. He says, in the beginning, the word already existed. Again, he's speaking about Jesus. He says, the word, this is Jesus we know, was with God. And the word was God. In fact, he, this is about Jesus, the Christ, he existed in the beginning with God and God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. So this little baby Jesus that we celebrate on this Christmas morning, not only has existed for all of eternity, scripture says that he was with God in the very beginning and in fact is God. He is not half human and half God. He's fully human, but he's also fully God. In John chapter 1 says in verse 3 that everything that exists, that tree in your room, the hairs on your head, not on your head, not on your chin, the clothes that you wear that came from synthetics or cotton, whatever it might be, all the things that we find on this planet, in fact, not just on this planet, but in this universe, and not just in this universe, but in the vast expanse of everything, all of it was existed through Jesus. You know, I've got some friends who, they do not believe in the existence of God and we talk quite a bit and, and we have got a great long-standing relationship and, you know, they often talk about the Big Bang Theory as the, the beginning of all life, all things and this 
this uh, perspective that there was this singular event that caused the expansion of the universe that actually science says continues to expand and expand and expand. And you know, I have conversations with them as somebody who, who stands under the authority of God's word and I say to them, you know, I, I agree with the Big Bang Theory. And in fact, according to scripture, I know what the Big Bang Theory sounded like. In fact, the Big Bang sounded like this. It says it in Genesis 1, let there be light. And this great truth revealed in scripture that there was a singular event through which all things have been created. And like science says that all of the universe continues to expand out from that singular event, isn't it remarkable to think that the word of God, the command of God, the let there be light of God, started everything and has continued to expand out. And I say to them, and it kind of catches them in a trap, and I'll say, you know, I love the truth that science says that the universe continues to expand because you know what that reminds me is that God's command has no ending. It continues to move out to the ends of the cosmos, creating more and more and more. And the very word that God spoke John says, is the word, Jesus. I mean, have you thought about it this way, that the very words that God spoke, let there be light, let there be water, let us create humankind in our image. Have you ever thought, and this is a deep, rich, theological, mysterious truth that the very words that God spoke, the, the radiance of God's command, the revelation of God's command, the extension of God's will, is Christ before Christ became born as Jesus. You know, these are lofty thoughts, but they're true thoughts emanating from the heart of God. In fact, in Hebrews 1, it says it this way, Long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors, the prophets, and now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. In fact, God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, he created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. In that one short section of Hebrews, it says Jesus has done seven things. He's already finished them, seven things. He's already wrapped up. In fact, that is going to be my sermon to begin 2021 to see the seven things that Jesus has already accomplished. And in fact, you can join us beginning right here, right now, today, at signing up for a 40-day devotional based on those seven finished works that Jesus has already done, beginning on the first day of 2021. Go to our website. You can go to belair.org forward slash fresh start. We want a fresh start in this new year. And you can sign up to receive those in your email inbox. And the first one will come on January 1st. And for the next 40 days, as we start the new year together, and as we go into this great sermon on January 3rd, we can be reminded that it's not the new year that gives us hope. It's not the new year before us that gives us a fresh start. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ. So we'd love for you to go to our website, beller.org forward slash fresh start. Sign up for that to receive it on January 1st. But listen to this. This is John 8, 56 through 58. Jesus says, your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and yet you have seen Abraham. He lived hundreds of years ago. And then Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was... I am. This Jesus, this human, is fully God 
has existed for all of eternity. In fact, another point in scripture, I believe Luke chapter 10, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. There is none other in the cosmos that is like him. He is worthy of our attention. He is worthy of being the center gravitational pull of our lives. And he has come in the flesh, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate in the flesh deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, God with us, the hope of glory. The cosmic Christ enters into the commonness of your life on this Christmas day and forevermore. Would it leave you with awestruck wonder that he loves you that much? He didn't ask you to go to him, he came to you. Into your situation, into your heartache, into your joys, into your dreams, into your needs. Receive him today on this Christmas day. All right, as we conclude finally in this third and final verse, it says, hail the heaven born Prince of peace, hail the son of righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons and daughters of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Light in life to all he brings. That's a reference to John 1, verses 4 through 5, where it says the word, remember the word that was in the beginning with God and was God, and all things came and was through him. It says the word, this is Jesus, gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. This year, like any other year that was or will be, can never extinguish the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And when you receive Jesus by faith, you too become part of the light of the world. The light of God dwells within you. As First Peter says, you were brought out of darkness into his marvelous light and we can rejoice on this Christmas day. But it goes on. From Malachi chapter four, verses one and two, the last book of the Old Testament, the last chapter of that last book. Malachi 4 says this, the Lord of heaven's army says, there will be a day of judgment that is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches and all, but for you who fear my name. In other words, for you who have put your faith and trust in Jesus, the sun, not S-O-N, but S-U-N, Bright and glorious and shining, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. On this Christmas day, we don't need to just be encouraged by the angels and not just awestruck by Christ Jesus, but it is also to be healed by the Prince of Peace, the Son of Righteousness. And Jesus has come not just to tell you that he loves you, not just to remind you that you are loved and to be encouraged this day, but to heal everything that is broken within you. Everything in your life, Jesus has come to set right. And unlike the angels who could sin and then be healed from it, be reconciled from it, there's this truth that whether it's choices we made or choices that were made for us or things outside of our control, maybe we've been victims of, all of those things, Jesus has the power as the Prince of Peace, as the Son of Righteousness to rise up in your life, to begin and bring to completion in His presence one day, complete healing, emotionally, relationally, psychologically, spiritually. So friends, my prayer for you and for me in this Christmas season is that we would listen to what the angels sing and it would bring our attention back to Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace, our Son of Righteousness, that we would get that gift again in our life and we would give it away to others. May God bless you in this Christmas day, now and forevermore. Let's pray. Jesus, you are worth it. 
May our lips and our lives, like the angels, like creation, like those that have gone before us, give you all the glory now and forevermore. It's in your mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen.